Okay guys, so we're leaving for a trip and I totally forgot to Botox myself, but luckily I had some in the fridge ready for emergency. <laughs> so here we go, let's turn this on. Okay guys, don't try this at home. Hi, my beauties. So we have a really fun video for you. This is a compilation of my most recent videos and clips that were put together of all indications for Botox. So all the things that we can use to rejuvenate the face, use Botox to change facial structures, facial shape, on label, off label, all the uses of Botox, brow lift, nasal slimming, nasal lifting for the chin, gummy smile, lip flip, jawline contouring, trapezius Botox, neck smoothing, platysmal band, crow's feet, glabella, forehead lines. So hopefully you enjoy watching this video and again, Again, it's just a compilation of my most recent videos where we talk about all things Botox and neuromodulators. I wanted to dedicate a video just to neuromodulators, Botox, Dysport, Javot, Xeomin, Daxify, all the different neuromodulators and treatments and things that you can learn as a consumer and a patient to make sure that bad outcomes don't happen to you. You can find a provider who you trust and to make better informed decisions on what treatment or treatments may be best for you. Neuromodulators can actually do a lot for neck rejuvenation. And when I mean neuromodulators, I mean chemicals that affect the synapse nerve complex and relax the muscles. So that could be Botox, it could be Daxify, which is the longer lasting Botox or neuromodulator. It could be Javo, it could be Dysport, it could be Xeomin, which is a preservative free type of neuromodulator. There's so many on the market now. I believe there's eight or nine on the market now. Botox can actually help relax the neck muscles. And there's lots of different injection techniques in the neck. As a provider, I usually will only target one or two areas that are the most prominent um, findings clinically for someone who comes in for neck rejuvenation. Say someone has horizontal horizontal neck bands, but they don't have any platysmal bands. We'll focus on the horizontal neck bands. Or sometimes people will have just more like crepey skin, but they don't actually have the sternocleidomastoid or platysmal kind of banding patterns um, in the neck. So we'll focus more on like the uh, smoothing out that crepey kind of lax skin. The problem is, is that I feel that sometimes people who are not as highly trained or more novice injectors will give too much Botox in the neck. And that's when you can get into some serious side effects like dysphagia. Dysphagia in medicine just means the inability to swallow. So it's not like you can't swallow, you know, water or saliva. It's more like if you're eating a bolus of food or like a dry piece of chicken, like you're gonna have to wash it down with some water. So if you weaken the muscles enough, which has happened from you know less than highly trained injectors, you can have problems with swallowing, which sounds terrifying and it is scary. Um, also, if you weaken the neck muscles too much when you're doing core or Pilates um, or like core workouts, you kind of inhibit the ability of that neck muscle to be engaged during core strength. So be mindful of that. Um, I do about 20 to 25 units of Botox in my neck. I work out five days a week and part of my workout is working out with my trainer and I do do um, a lot of core strength training with him and then I do bar and in our bar Pilates classes we do a lot of core work like on the floor and I never have an issue with my neck stability or my neck strength despite doing preventative Botox in, in my neck. So other areas that you can inject in the neck or different areas that you can inject neuromodulators into the neck for reju rejuvenation include my micro droplets of neuromodulator kind of along in like horizontal banding patterns to help relax that thin platysmal muscle that when it contracts, it can kind of like bunch up the skin and make the skin on the neck look crepey and, and textured. That's different than the injection technique that we use to kind of minimize the appearance of tech neck lines or the horizontal neck bands, which may not only occur with age, but could be anatomical as many young patients have horizontal neck bands as well. So it's usually like one, maybe 1 1.5 units along the horizontal neck bands to kind of relax that underlying platysmal muscle and the superficial fascia, which contracts and can um, help smooth out the horizontal neck bands as well. Another injection technique for neck is when people have 
Let's see if I can do it. When you go like this and you have your sternocleidomastoid and you have your platysmal bands that kind of pop out, that can make us look like angry or mad or old or aged. And by doing Botox in those platysmal bands, it can kind of help soften those. Obviously mine aren't Botox because you can see them popping out right here. It's also more apparent in people who, you know, are thinner um, they don't have as much fat there or, um, you know, they work out a lot and the muscles are a little bit stronger or more robust. So we've talked about neuromodulator for smoothing out the neck skin. We've talked about the horizontal neck band injection pattern for Botox. I say Botox, but I mean any neuromodulator in that area for the bands. And then the other thing that's really um, helpful and a, and a good uh, technique is doing a little bit of Botox into the kind of like area where there's like the AP projection. So like right here. So when you do Botox in this area, it's about 10 to 15 units and that can really kind of tuck up and under that area, which gives a really beautiful profile angle. So when you're looking at your AP projection of the chin and you do a little bit of Botox right here or a little bit in the little banding pattern right under the submental area, that kind of tucks that up and it gives that profile to where the chin kind of tucks up and then goes down to the neck. So then you don't have that straight line that has like a Benjamin Franklin looking kind of profile, which nobody wants. So doing a little bit of Botox here to kind of tuck that under is a really beautiful aesthetic outcome. Um, and then that's different than the Nefertiti lift, which is jawline Botox, in which we inject a neuromodulator along the jaw, the jawbone, and it's right underneath the jawbone, and that is to minimize the tension or pull of the muscles going down so that the resting tone of the muscles that pull up go unopposed and just help delineate that jawline. And we usually do 10 units per side. But again, my kind of internal mechanism for myself as an injector is I never do more than 25 units in the neck, 20 to 25 units in the neck, um, because then that's just too much and it's overkill. And then you get into, you know, the concerns for dysphagia or, you know, neck weakness when you're working out. So. That's pretty much all there is to know about uh, neuromodulators and the effect on neck rejuvenation. So many of my patients will use the term baby Botox and baby Botox is just using a little bit of neuromodulator to relax the muscles and be preventative while still allowing the patient to animate and be very um, natural in their animation and, and making faces. So baby Botox is usually just in a targeted area where somebody's at the highest risk for aging, whether it's, you know, sometimes people even in their 20s will have pronounced forehead headlines or even you know whatever age or decade they're in that life will have um, crow's feet and some people have no crow's feet and forehead lines some people will have glabella lines and no crow's feet so you kind of get the area that you can see the most animation on your face and just do a baby Botox at Mount and what I mean by that is you do half of what you usually would do for a neuromodulator to take effect and smooth right tids to smooth out the wrinkles the dynamic right tids and when you do a baby Botox you can still kind of push through and make your your facial animation but you're you're kind of preventing your skin from folding and getting etched in lines over time I always tell my patients it's much easier to hold on to what you have and preserve your youth than trashing it and neglecting it and then trying to reverse it over time because that you know that's just a harder situation to correct we can do things to correct it but usually it, it means treatments beyond just neuromodulator or Botox the forehead is, is, a, is a perfect example I love giving my um, my patients baby Botox for prevention of forehead lines because say you know I'm 46 now and say I've never done Botox and I've been animating and raising my eyebrows for 46 years it would be super heavy if I all of a sudden at 46 you know started Botox and did too much too fast and the skin has been stretched out from animating for those four and a half decades of life and then it just gets really heavy over the upper brow so hopefully that makes sense and I love to do these teaching points because um, this is fun fact about me. Between my residency and my fellowship, I had to take a year off while I had my son because I was a third year resident with a newborn and it was really, really hard to be a new mom and just take my boards and exams and present at Grand Rounds and round on my patients and just be a resident. So before jumping into my fellowship, I took a time off and I took a full-time academic um, position at UCLA where I did my residency training and I was a full-time, full faculty staff uh, professor at UCLA where I taught the dermatology residents and med students. So as a professor of dermatology and dermatologic surgery and cosmetic dermatology, this is how I treat the resident, residents and this is how I teach the medical students. So I'm kind of teaching you guys the same way that I teach them. So if this is 
a little bit over your heads. Um, I'd rather you be in that situation and be able to Google things and look it up. And I just want to talk to you straight like I would the Durham residents and med students and um, just elevate everybody's understanding of how neuromodulators work, how they affect the anatomy, and why you'll see some people injecting differently than others. And so hopefully after watching this video, it'll make better sense. So if Botox or Dysport or a certain neuromodulator was working for you before and all of a sudden it stopped working or maybe it's not lasting as long or kicking in as fast, sometimes what you can do is switch to a different neuromodulator. So we have so many to choose from now. We even have Daxify, which is a new longer lasting neuromodulator that lasts about six to nine months as opposed to three to six. And this may be an option for you. Also, just make sure that your injector is not watering down Botox because being an instructor and teaching other injectors how to inject, you'd be surprised. I've been into offices before where they're watering down their Botox so much to get a cheaper price point for patients, but then it doesn't last as long, it doesn't kick in as fast, and it's just not as good. So make sure that your provider is reconstituting it the right way, and if it's not working as well, maybe switch to a different neuromodulator. Let's talk about Botox Lip Flip because Lip Flip Botox is different than Gummy Smile Botox and people always get this wrong. Gummy Smile is at the apical triangle right here and that helps keep the lips down and not the gums showing so much if you have a gummy smile. Lip Flip is usually one, two, maybe three units per side on each side of the upper lip right here. And what it does is it prevents the orbicularis oris muscle from contracting and curling in. So if you're one of those people who you smile and your upper lip disappears and becomes a little thin line, you're a good candidate for lips flip. If you smile and your lip doesn't really curl under, then you're not really a candidate for lip flip. But what you do is when you do lip flip Botox right here, is it just keeps the upper lip fuller when you smile. So I guess mine curls up a little bit. So I guess I should probably have some lip flip Botox. I don't have any in there right now, but that's how you know if you're a candidate for it and that's the outcome of it. So what Botox for lip flip does is when you smile, it keeps the lip fuller when you smile so that that muscle doesn't curl under. But what can happen sometimes in the wrong candidate or for someone who has a different anatomy, it can also elongate the length from the nose to the vermilion border of the upper mouth. So it can make your like upper lip look longer, which isn't an aesthetically appealing look. So it's always important um, to keep that in mind. So lip flip Botox, basically we do a little bit of Botox around the upper lip, but if you have like a longer upper lip or if you have increased distance between the nose and the upper lip, you're usually not a good candidate for it and I wouldn't recommend it. That's the difference between gummy smile Botox and lip flip Botox. So gummy smile injection is right here, the apical triangle, and that helps keeping the upper lip from riding up too high and showing the gum line when you smile. And if people smile and it just goes up too high, it keeps the upper lip from floating up too high and below the gum line, which is a natural, beautiful looking smile. My last patient of the day came in and she wanted uh, Botox for um, perioral rightid, so around the mouth, like little like smoker's line. So we did a little bit of Botox, but also some filler sometimes will help kind of um, smooth out those etched in lines without making the lips look like they're overdone or like any filler is there at all. So just half a syringe, usually of Obella, is usually what I use to treat the smoker's lines, even though most of us have these lines without smoking and um, sometimes Botox can be used there to kind of like decrease the muscular contraction of the obicularis oris muscle that goes around the mouth contributing to those lines so then it's smooth when you do this I just got home from work don't judge me by my hair I just did Botox on my neck so where I did it I did a little bit about 10 units under my submental area here because I love that it like tucks that in and on profile it just kind of like helps that little piece of skin just kind of be tucked in. I also did little micro droplets of Botox in my neck. And patients always ask to this, it doesn't affect like my workouts. I do Pilates and core strength training with my trainer. It never like inhibits my neck muscles, but it just really helps smooth that area out. Um, but Botox is a really great way to just kind of help soften and um, help with like neck laxity. Um, other indications for Botox is the Nefertiti lift that goes along the jawline. We usually do 10 units per side, and the way that that works is the muscles in the face and neck are antagonistic, protagonistic on one another. They're always pulling and pushing on one another. So when you soften the muscles that pull down, the resting tone of the muscles that pull up define and delineate that jawline. Um, other things that we can do for platysmal bands, which go this way, you know, when people have really like bandy necks, 
We can do Botox usually like 10 units per band to kind of help soften that and make that not so like apparent. And then other things that we can do with Botox, oh, tech necklines or horizontal neck bands, which can sometimes happen with age or be accentuated um, with age, but also just happens like anatomically. So you can do about 10 units in the neck bands too. So there's lots of different things that we can do for lower face rejuvenation and neck with neuromodulators also. I use a 33 gauge needle. This is the smallest needle available on the market. It's a 33 gauge needle, and it makes the Botox injection experience much more, much more pleasant for the patient. It's a little bit more expensive, so it's more overhead, so a lot of offices don't wanna pay the extra money, and instead they use 30 gauge needles, which are bigger. So when you talk about the size of a needle, the lower the number, the bigger the needle. So a 30 gauge needle is bigger than a 33 gauge needle. Um, so it hurts more. So I always want you know patient comfort to be a priority in my office. It takes more money and it's a little bit more expensive, but the experience is much better for the patient. Less bruising, less discomfort, and um, it is more expensive, so not a lot of offices like to spend the money. But after injecting for 15 years, I've actually never not injected using a 15, um, using a 33 gauge needle. All right. Here I'm using masseter Botox to soften the masseter muscle to prevent teeth clenching and grinding for my beautiful patient. It's always really important to palpate the muscle to ensure the most appropriate injection sites, to avoid complications, and to get the most effective treatments. Typically, I inject 15 to 30 units per side, and the results last three to six months. Another side effect of masseter Botox is that it can slim the face, which is aesthetically indicated for certain people who have full, full faces or a circular face and want to have a more feminized, heart-shaped face. Okay guys, so another commonly area, common area that people ask for Botox is for a nose lift. So nose lift Botox allows the nasal tip to kind of be lifted, like when you smile. So sometimes people have a downturning nose or what we call a plunging tip plastic surgeons call it a plunging tip when you smile from the side in your profile view when you smile and the tip of your nose like plunges down and like pulls the nose down like almost like a hook nose then you usually will benefit from botox in the depressor septinase muscle which is the base of the columella so this is the columella this like strip of um nasal cartilage tissue that is in between the nares when you do a little bit of botox in the base of that it prevents the plunging tip phenomenon from happening so when you smile the tip of your nose doesn't bend forward and it kind of like elevates the um the tip of the nose for like a little like tinkerbell nose so that's something that i get commonly asked in the office there's another um requested treatment with botox to make the nose smaller it doesn't technically make the nose smaller because your nose is made out of cartilage and structures that can't move and change with Botox. But sometimes when you debulk the nasalis muscle, which is on the side of the um, the nose, which we call the bunny lines, you could do anywhere from like 2.5 to 5 to 10 units per side, which can kind of help slim and make the nose appear slimmer. Kind of like when you contour your nasal um, dorsum with, um, with um, makeup and you make it look slimmer. Botox kind of like debulks that muscle contraction that makes the nose look more um, kind of like pixie-like or defined or slimmer. Um, another area that people commonly ask about is the ala. I don't really recommend doing Botox on the nasal ala because a um, it's not as effective because most of that's cartilage. There's very little muscle there and also it's not going to really change the shape of your nose. It can actually um, help people who have like flaring nasies, nasi. So like people who like have like little flaring of like, like dragon noses, it can like make it look a little bit less pronounced, but I wouldn't recommend it. It doesn't really make that significant of a change unless you really have like flared nares and that's usually more a cartilaginous bony infrastructure problem, not like a muscular problem. Um, the apical triangle, which is this area between um, the nose and upper um, lip, cutaneous upper lip, and this junction here at the um, superior portion of the nasal labial fold, doing Botox here can help um, correct a gummy smile. So when you smile and your upper lip rides way higher than your teeth line and you can show, have this gum line that's showing, it's showing you can kind of relax a gummy smile with a beautiful aesthetic outcome. But I feel like the most commonly asked um, procedure for the nose is for bunny lines and then also for na um, a nose lift Botox treatment and that's where you get more like that pixie nose so you don't have like this plunging tip when you smile from the profile view. I'll also show you, so like when you're from the side, or actually let's do it this way, um, yeah, so if you're, if you're, ugh, how do I explain this? Okay, so here's an example of na nose lift Botox, right? So from the side, when you smile, sometimes people have a plunging tip, like the tip of their nose, like 
goes downward when they smile and doing a little bit of Botox right here will allow the nose to kind of like lift up for like a pixie like Tinkerbell nose. So that's one that I commonly get asked about nasal lift Botox, which is Botox in the columella, which is the base of the columella. Hi, my beauty. So I just did trapezius Botox about three weeks ago and it just kicked in as in, in full effect. So I did about 30 units per side along my trapezius muscle right here. And um, I did it because I get a lot of neck and shoulder strain from just um, operating heavy lasers all day, doing surgery and injections all day. I get a lot of tension in my neck. So I did the trapezius Botox on each side and it also just gives a beautiful like feminizing effect and elongates the neck and just makes a very um, feminine shoulder line. So I just want to show you guys Botox in the trapezius in full effect. When you're treating the forehead muscles, this is there's a muscle that goes across the whole forehead called the frontalis muscle, and it's a thin, flat muscle that usually goes across the for, whole forehead. Some people has uh, some people have a um, frontalis muscle that goes this far back, so they recruit, and sometimes they'll have even wrinkles up here. And when their injector doesn't properly inject their forehead, they can still have like little lines up here. So it's important to assess and animate right before injection to make sure that you're getting the muscle where it's the most active, and just to kind of look at everybody's anatomy because I used to. Have have an attending that says each patient isn't going to read the textbook and have the perfectly placed anatomy and anatomical um, there's anatomical variance within muscle groups so you want to inject and have each customized treatment for each individual patient be based on their anatomy not just follow the dots and just kind of inject everyone the same. So when you're treating the forehead um, with Botox, you want to get the frontalis muscle. Now everybody's frontalis muscle will be at different strength, a different size, and they may animate a little bit differently. So I don't want to just give like a cookie cutter blanket statement on how to inject the frontalis, but to get rid of these forehead lines, you want to inject neuromodulator across the forehead and a very even and very customized treatment. You don't want to go too close to the brow because then you get a heaviness on the upper brow. And that's what a lot of newer injectors do. They make the mistake of doing too much Botox in the frontalis to erase the lines and then people walking around like with this heavy brow looking weird for like three months or six to eight months if it's Daxify or even longer. So um, the other thing to note is that the um, 11 lines are the glabella lines which um, is a movement that's created by the procerus muscle that goes down the middle right here and the two corrugator muscles. The injection points for the glabellar lines or the 11 lines, these frown lines that we get here is an injection point here, here, and here. Now again, this is not an anatomy course. This is not an injection course. This is just me being on YouTube trying to educate you guys and give you a little bit of a background. But I don't want to be held responsible for you know teaching you guys, but I just want to educate you and empower you with information so that you understand why injectors are doing things that the way that they're, they're doing them. So when you inject the 11 lines or the glabella lines, you want to inject here, here, and here, and the procerus muscle and the two corrugator muscles go out into that um, area. And so you want to target that. Now, sometimes people will have movement still here at the lateral tail of the corrugator muscles, and they'll say, well, doctor, I'm still moving. The thing is, is that you never want to inject lateral, or I'm sorry, medi um, you never want to inject lateral to the mid pupillary line because you can risk dropping the lid. So it's better to have a little bit of movement that's coming from the tails of your corrugator right here than have no movement at all and risk dropping your lid. This just comes from, I've been doing this for over 20 years now, and it just comes with experience and really understanding how the neuromodulators work how you reconstitute them in different ways and how much it can migrate, how animated your, your patient is and the variant and anatomy that can vary from patient to patient. But for um, kind of all intents and purposes, doing the glabella lines is doing Botox along here, doing the forehead lines is here, and there's a variant and um, you know wiggle room with each individual patient. And I always think less is more, being more conservative when you inject, it's you can always put more in, you can't take it out with, once it's in there. So that's how you inject the 11 lines and the forehead lines. Oh my gosh, you guys, so this just popped up in my feed. 26 Botox injection patterns, free PDF download. This is so cringe and so scary, you guys. So just know that there are some people out there who are actually injecting patients based on these like PDF downloads that they've like memorized, which is not correct. This is way too low on the brow. This is gonna probably give somebody a drop to lid or heavy brow or just have a weird frozen look. So. This is not how you inject Botox, and please check credentials when you're getting your face injected by a provider, because if somebody is injecting you based on this, 
it's going to give you complications and side effects that you don't want. This is probably why we're seeing so many patients having complications and heavy brows and heavy eyelids and lid ptosis. The placement's all wrong. He's way too deep to the corrugator muscle. He's injecting too much too fast for this poor little patient. And he's using a 30 gauge needle, which is super painful. You should always use a 33 gauge. I can't even watch this. My beautiful patient just came in and she had Botox performed by another injector and he did not place the Botox correctly and caused this complication called blepharitosis. So I just want to make sure that this doesn't happen to any of you guys and knowledge is power and sharing this information I feel like is useful. So what happens is when the Botox is placed too deep or too low on the brow or if it's watered down and not reconstituted appropriately, it can migrate further than the injection site. And what happens is, is it knocks out this levator muscle that's responsible for keeping the eye open because it migrates beyond the orbital septum. So basically, if it's too deep, too much, too low, or not reconstituted appropriately, this can happen, and I don't want this to happen to any of you guys. The Botox migrated from the top of the frontalis down past the orbital septum into the levator muscle. So now she can't completely open her eye for about three to six months. So just to educate you guys and make sure that this doesn't happen to you, this is her normal eye, this is her ptosis eye, and the injector should always stay medial to the mid-pupil area line, not go lateral to the mid pupillary line, and also stay superficial and not go too deep because if you do, the neuromodulator can migrate past the orbital septum causing this, and this is something you do not want to have to deal with. Hi my beauty, so quick germ tip of the day. I just had a patient who came in and she had, when she smiled, lateral crow's feet that are pretty inferior. So the key to treating crow's feet is that you, the placement of Botox has to be very precise and it has to be in three different injection sites around the obicularis oculi muscle, which is the muscle that goes around the eye. If you go too far lateral to get those lines that can happen right here, you, you risk knocking out the levator muscles that are responsible for lifting up the corners of the mouth when you smile, which will cause a droop. So whenever you want to target these crow's feet that are a little bit lower here you still have to inject around the ambicularis oculi muscle but the placement just has to be very precise and a little bit closer to the eye and you'll still be able to smooth out that line without the risk of a facial droop Okay, number two, teaching point of the day. Um, I do have sometimes a longer wait for my patients to get in to see me, and sometimes they have to cheat on me and go to other offices and get Botox, which one patient did, and she had a dropped smile. So the reason why this happens um, is because sometimes either injectors are not injecting the appropriate placement for crow's feet, and they go out way too far, and they knock out the muscle that's responsible for lifting up on the corner of the mouth, the um, zygomaticus. There's a levator muscle or a muscle that pulls up up on the corner of the smile and if injectors are injecting too far out they can knock that out so poor thing came to see me she's like I'll never cheat on you again which is fine I totally get it you know it's you gotta shop around and sometimes it's you know something that you need right away um, but just if you're going to an injector just don't be afraid to question how they reconstitute the Botox. Make sure they're not watering it down because that's the other reason why it can migrate out. If they are injecting in the proper placement and it's watered down and it migrates, it can knock that muscle out. Um, the other thing you have to be really careful with is Botox under the eyes. Because Botox under the eyes, you have to go to someone who really knows what they're doing because if you do too much or in the wrong place, you can have horrific side effects and you have to walk around with that for like three to six months if it's Botox. If it's Daxify, probably even longer. So just, I do do under eye Botox for select patients, but if you're a patient of mine, you know I always have you animate before I inject. I'm very methodical and very strategic with where I put the units because, you know, you can do a little bit like micro droplets along the lower um, under eye area to help minimize under eye wrinkles. But if you get it too close to the lacrimal gland, then you'll have problems with tearing. If you do it too close to, and you knock out the, um, you know, one of the muscles that helps hold the eyelid against the globe of the eye, then you'll get like an atropion. And then you're gonna like walk around looking like this for three months, which not only looks bad, but you're gonna get like a corneal abrasion because your eyes are gonna be dried out because you're not having that mucosal surface you will be juxtaposed to the globe of your eye. So just be really, really careful. Do I do Botox under the eye? Yes, but select patients, and I do it differently for everyone just based on their anatomy and how the, what their muscle recruitment looks like. Another thing to know about Botox for under the eye, because Botox is great for the crow's feet area, but another thing to know about Botox under the eye is that um, 
it can temporarily kind of impede your body's lymphatic drainage. So if you do gua sha or if you do like lymphatic um, drainage maneuvers on your face or your skin, that will help. But temporarily, once the orbicularis muscle gets softened, especially for the treatment of crow's feet, you your muscles are responsible with facial animation for mobilizing that lymphatic drainage of that fluid out of your face. And if your muscles are over Botox or there's too much there, then you get this kind of like puffiness around your eyes you can get above above your eye too um it usually lasts for like three or four days and then it'll go away and then your botox will kick in and you'll have those results that last three to six months but the reason why you can temporarily get that puffiness around your eyes is because it's hard for your muscles to mobilize to mobilize that fluid and it accumulates there and that especially happens with um, infraorbital botox too now i know you guys are going to ask me about jelly roll botox usually when the patient looks the gaze is straight ahead and up and you do like one or two units actually just one or half a unit like right here I, if i do two units it would be like one and one but again this is not a channel for medical advice i'm just explaining these things to you guys so as patients you're more informed when you go to your provider and you ask for these services um, but if you do a uh, jelly roll Botox it can help with that little crease here but you have to be very careful because I see people outside of my office do this wrong they make their patients have these horrible side effects and then they come running to me to fix it so careful with under eye Botox it can be useful but it can also hurt you too so just be, be careful so I wanted to do a quick teaching point on eyebrow lifting Botox or brow lift Botox. When doing a brow lift, you want to do about one to two, maybe even five um, units of a neuromodulator of choice, depending on the neuromodulator, whether it's Botox, Daxify, Javo, Xeomin, Dysport, whatever neuromodulator you use, this is the injection point for it right here. And this helps raise the brow. A common mistake that I see rookie injectors or newer injectors making and a lot of my patients come in with this complication that I have to fix sometimes is when they do injection of Botox right here thinking this is going to lift the brow this is not where you inject to lift the brow this will only drop the brow there's a muscle called the frontalis muscle that goes across the forehead and when you inject Botox here it relaxes it so this is the um, injection point for when you want to erase the little rainbows that happen on the lateral brow injecting Botox right here not here but here at the lateral brow targets the orbicularis muscle that goes around the eye that's a sphincter-like muscle that when it contracts, it pulls down the brow. So when you do a little neuromodulator in the lateral brow, it allows the frontalis muscle to go unopposed and it lifts the brow. So the teaching point is for patients and injectors, brow lift Botox injection is here and for smoothing the forehead above the brow is an injection here but it's going to drop the lid usually when we inject botox you want to do an equal amount or kind of a, it's a balancing act because you want to open the eye but you don't want to spock it too much and so you want to relax it but it's, it just depends on everyone's anatomy their muscle strength so if you're a patient of mine you know i always have you animate prior to my injection because i want to see where you're strongest and we're to target the muscles most effectively and precisely for the best and most natural looking results so sometimes people have a a golf volley chin or a pebbly chin where you see like little indentations on the chin. Usually if it is from a muscular contraction that's happening underneath the skin and this thin, the skin is thinning over time and it shows that underlying vasculature through, what we can do is Botox in the chin to kind of help smooth out the chin. Sometimes filler or laser is needed when you have a textured chin. If you have the pew to orange kind of skin type where you're having larger dilated pores and you're having texture changes on your skin, usually that's more filler or laser. But when you have a smooth chin and when you contract the mentalis muscle, which is the muscle under the chin skin, and you get kind of like a, a pebbled pulling and dimpling phenomenon on the chin, we can use a little bit of Botox in the chin. Usually it's about five units and you do, or sorry, six units and you do two units, two units, one unit, one unit. This is only for expert injectors, you guys, because people mess this up all the time. And if you don't do it correctly, and if you go outside of the um, kind of, if you go into the no-fly zone for Botox, you can get drooping, you can get sagging, you can get almost like a knockout of your DAOs that's asymmetric or not a good look. You're gonna look like you had a stroke or look like you're like post-ictal. So just make sure that you go to someone who's highly trained when you're getting your chin done. But Botox can um, be a great way to smooth out the, ch the chin skin. Um, another teaching point that I wanted to do, just to educate you guys as patients who are going to look for a provider for neuromodulator um, or, or Botox, 
but for a neuromodulator or Botox in the, the um, nasal area, I'm seeing this a lot, I think it's all over TikTok. So the safe areas to inject Botox in the nose include the nasalis muscle, which is this muscle that goes over the bridge of the nose. And sometimes when people smile, Mine are Botox, so you can't see mine. But they'll make little lines here, which we call the bunny line. So you'll call bunny line Botox, and you do a little bit of neuromodulator here and here. And sometimes it can slim the nose, but more um, importantly, it's used to help smooth the, the nasal skin so you don't have that scrunched up bunny looking kind of wrinkles on your nose, especially if everywhere else is Botox and your face is nice and smooth, except you just have these lines here. Bunny Botox um, or nasalis Botox is a great treatment. Also, it can kind of cheat and um, smooth out the under eye wrinkles because this is kind of a no fly zone for Botox. Advanced injectors, including myself, will do a little bit of Botox, but very selectively and only once in a while and only on certain patients who are can good candidates for it. But doing the nasalis Botox is a good way to smooth the under eye skin without actually injecting the under eye skin, which makes it a, a safer injection treatment. You have to be, sh be careful with under the eyes or any more um, lateral because you can get an ectropion or change the shape of your eye and there's a lot of other weird things that can happen that are beyond the scope of this video. Um, but other areas in the nose where we can inject Botox include the um, right here along the columella, columella of the nose and that helps with a plunging tip. Sometimes when people smile from the side, the tip of their nose will sink down or dip down. And by doing a couple little units of Botox here, again with an expert injector, because this is a higher level of injection technique for um, not new injectors, but people who are seasoned injectors, doing a little bit of Botox here will help um, protect the plunging tip from pointing down so when you smile your tip of your nose doesn't um it's kind of slim down a lot of people ask about nasal ala botox sometimes i think you know depending on who you follow and on social media i think it's all over tiktok how you can do um alar botox to prevent your nasal um ala from flaring when you smile or to slim the nose you have to remember it's mainly cartilage in this area and a lot of that's just like hype and a lot of just you know um I think that's it's just something that you see online that's not like really a true um, treatment with Botox because I feel that you can only change the shape of the nose so much and people over promise and under deliver the um, effects of Botox on the nose and you also have to be very careful because when injecting certain areas you don't want to knock out adjacent muscles that are going to make you look weird or smile weird or you know go in for an injection to make your nose look smaller but then you have like an asymmetric smile and you like look weird so just be mindful of that but the safe zones to um, inject along the nose are the nasalis the columella and then sometimes in the apical triangle which is here and here to help um, relax a gummy smile so that your upper lip doesn't ride up too high and show a bunch of your gums when you smile so what is DAO Botox and what does it do DAO just stands for the muscle called the depressor anguli oris muscle and it's the muscle that attaches the corner of the mouth to the mandible and it shortens and contracts as we get older which gives the mouth a downturning frowning appearance, especially as we get older. So when you do a little bit of Botox at the bottom of the DAO, and placement's very important so that you don't cause a, a smile asymmetry or facial droop, but anywhere from two and a half to five units in the depressor anguli oros muscle on either side can upturn the angles of the mouth to give a more pleasant, youthful, happy look. I just had a beauty who just came in and she said that she's starting to notice her angles of her mouth are starting to be downturned. So she looks like she's frowning or like mad at rest when in fact she's not. So there's two ways you can address this. Well, actually there's many more ways than these two, but these are the two simplest in office procedures that we can do to just upturn those angles of the mouth so you don't look like you have resting bitch face. So the easiest thing to do is Botox and it's the depressor anguli oris muscle, which we call the DAO, and it pulls down on the corners of the mouth. So doing a little bit of Botox, two and a half to five units per side will help upturn the angles of the mouth so you look pleasant and positive at rest. And the other way we could do it is by doing a little bit of filler in the angles of the mouth. That will also help keep your skin from folding on itself and it will help um, minimize something called angular chelitis if you ever get a little irritation um, from the corners of the mouth as well. So that's my derm tip of the day. Love you guys. I've been doing Botox since I was like 22 years old. Now that I'm older, I feel like I don't need as much of it anymore because I just, I've been doing it my whole life. So I barely use Botox, I now use Daxify and only have to do it like twice a year, if that. And I usually just do like my crow's feet, my forehead, my glabella. I like to do Botox or Daxify along the, my jawline for the Nefertiti lift. Sometimes I'll do it in my neck. When you start early, you don't have to do it as much as you get older. You acquire less and less. So that's it. And now I'm gonna hop in the shower. 
Okay, you guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Hopefully after watching this video, you'll learn a little bit more about neuromodulators and make better educated decisions on what treatments will be right for you. Also, what hands and what skilled provider do you trust your precious face in? So hopefully with the tools that you gain from this video, you can make more informed decisions and go to providers who you completely trust and um, can ask any questions freely without um, feeling embarrassed or um, hesitant to move forward with your treatments. As always, please like, subscribe, and share this channel with anyone who wants non-sponsored content from a board-certified dermatologist. And also subscribe to my channel so that you can be eligible to win our giveaway products for MDR, my skincare line. We'll give away free medical-grade skincare products to my subscribers um, and to be able to uh, participate in those giveaways because it's only for my subscribers. And I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for hanging out with me. And I'll see you next week.